Hello and welcome to an ANOVA Systems video. My name is Sam Bromley and this recorded video is from the 2012 ANOVA Systems Customer Day breakout session, Best Modeling Practices. So what I'm going to show you in this video are fundamental best practices on different levels of the software and these productivity tools are a way of increasing your ability to model much quicker and with much more proficiency within SOLIDWORKS. Okay, a brief explanation of what we can see here. We've got an assembly and as we can see on the left hand side between the headset itself and the headphone there is a component missing which should be connecting these two. And these two components are free to move around at the moment so what I'm going to do is I'm going to build that section there, that connector, and run through some best practices when doing so. so I'm going to flick over to a partially completed component we've got here. And first off, I'm going to talk about what we call the S key. That's S for shortcut. So S key on the keyboard, if I hit S, what I get is a contextual sensitive menu with useful tools that I can find simply by hitting the S key. Now this menu is customizable simply by right clicking and going to customize. That brings up the customized dialog box. And from here, I can flick through different levels of the S key. So assembly, drawing, sketching, initially like we were on part. And what I can do here is go through different groups of, to of toolbars, selecting different tools and populating the S key. So, for instance, if I go to my sketch tool here, I can simply drag and drop any tool that I want from here, perhaps a linear sketch pattern, and drop it onto my S key. So now, when I hit S key at sketch level, I'll have a quick option to specify that I'm going to create a linear pattern. So this really increases the productivity of you moving around your, your cursor. So quite a simple thing, but can increase your productivity and, uh, and decrease the amount of time you're moving that cursor around. Okay, there's another thing I'm going to explain. Um, I myself, personally, I like to map certain keys to the keyboard. So if you move along to the keyboard tab here, you see what I can do here is associate a hotkey on my keyboard to a particular command in SideWorks. There's a great range of commands. We can search for one of those, co those commands such as pattern. And for instance, I can specify that my linear pattern, my hotkey for that is going to be P. So from now on, if I hit P while I'm at part level, creating a feature, my linear pattern will start automatically. So again, decreasing the amount of time you're moving the, the cursor around. And when you get used to the positions of those hotkeys, you can really increase your, your speed in modeling. I mean, nonetheless, we're going to move on to having a look at this part I have. I want to discuss symmetry and the importance of starting your model symmetrical to your planes if you're going to be creating a symmetrical product. So first off, I've got a, a part here, and as you can see, my planes run dead through the center. Now, the reason why that's important is because when I go to extrude or pattern or mirror features afterwards, it saves me from creating extra planes as planes of symmetry. So those planes are dead symmetrical already, and I can simply select those to create mirrors. And that's a really good practice, especially for a symmetrical product. So I've got a few sketches already created here, and I'm simply going to extrude these. And I'm going to specify again a mid-plane extrusion to ensure that symmetry is always retained within my model, like so. I'm going to put a through cut extrude, extrude through here. So just a bit of sketching initially. Waking up the center point of a, a circle is a really great useful thing. You can see that the center point wakes up if I hover around the edge of that circle. I'm simply going to hit D on my keyboard. I've got a hotkey associated to D to dimension, which means my dimension tool opens up automatically without me having to go in the top left hand corner. Specify dimension, and simply cut extrude through all. Nothing really special here. I'm 
And likewise, I'm going to repeat that process on this face here. To get that size in. Now, what I'm going to do this time is I'm going to leave that dimension as it is, but I want to define it. So it's 9.138. Now, what I'd like to do is ensure that that 9.138 equals the 9 value that I applied to this dimension here, which is creating the circular cut. And we'll do that in a second. I'm going to extrude cut through here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to double click that feature and it will show you the dimensions associated to it. I'm simply going to right click, link value, and this allows me to give that particular dimension a name. So I'm going to call it diameter. Hit OK. Now if I double click this feature, that the very same dimension here which is associated this cut extrude, I can right click on, link value, and I can link it to the value that I just created, meaning that those two dimensions will always equal each other. So we do a rebuild, and that resizes very slightly. Okay, so that's the first component I want to create. I now need to go about putting that inside my assembly. Now to do that, I'm simply going to drag and drop that into my required assembly. that now belongs inside my top level assembly. I'd like to actually add it to this assembly here. So I'm simply going to drag and drop. It then places it into the sub-assembly. So if we now open up that sub-assembly, the component exists at this level. Now I'm going to put some mates onto here now to position this component against my existing sub-assembly. So nothing special here again, very simply going to make these two components together. I would also like to make sure that a face here, an existing face, are parallel. That's now sort of fixed as one. I'm going to go back to the main assembly. I'm going to fix these components in a position. So first off, I'd like to ensure that they're always dead center. So a nice and easy way of doing that is I'm going to use an advanced mate. Advanced mates are a really useful best practice because they actually combine usually lots of individual standard mates into one mate. So it saves you a bit of time in regards to the application and the, the applying of that mate. So to do that, first off I specify a width selection. That's going to be this face and the opposing parallel face of that same component. My tab selection is going to be the position I'd like them to be between, which is going to be this face. And likewise, the parallel face connecting to that. They now belong central to each other. What you will notice on the right hand click of my cursor, there is a green tick. If I hit that, that will accept that mate for me. Again, reducing the amount of movement of your cursor. Lastly, I'm going to apply a mate between these two cylindrical faces and the components position co-centric to each other. Good. Now, I'm simply going to mirror these across. So we've got two sets of, of headphones. Again, nothing really too special here. What I'm now going to do is I'm going to focus on creating on the right hand headphone that's been mirrored a 3D spline so I can create the jack that would fit into the headphone itself. Now to do that, I'm going to create a new part in context to the assembly. 
I'm going to edit that part in context, which means I'm editing it while I'm still in the assembly. And I'm going to draw a spline. So that's just going to draw a line while in a 3D sketch, which means I don't have to specify a plane to sketch on. Wake up that center point and draw a relatively straight line coming out from that position. Now attached to this, I'm then going to do a 3D spline. Now defining splines, even at 2D level, can be quite a complex thing. And certainly at 3D sketching level, it's even more complicated. So first of all, what we've got is we've got a, a spline, which is actually planar currently. And because we're in 3D sketch mode, I'm going to go through a good practice here to add some more dimension to that spline position. So I'd like to be able to move those spline points along the Z axis. Now to do that, I'm simply going to go through my predefined orthographic views one by one and move these spline, spline points accordingly. The reason why I go through these one by one is it because it gives me much more control over the positions of those. And what you commonly will find is if you move those points while in, say, such an isometric view, the spline points themselves will shoot off into the distance, which can be quite irritating. Let's go through those, see how it looks. If we move back into a sort of perspective view, we can see we've got a little bit more dimension to that spline now. Now I'm going to open up that spline at its own part, like so. I'm going to show you a few things we can do with then creating that sweep. So we do need a plane at the very end of here. To put a plane at the end of that line, I'm simply going to select the line itself and select its endpoint. That will give me a line which is coincident to the endpoint of a line, but perpendicular to that line itself. And then simply start a sketch on it. You can use the S key here to open up and select a circle and give it a dimension. Let's make it three mil. So the next thing we need to do is create a sweep. Now what you will find with a sweep is that any connecting positions between entities will split the faces like so. Now aesthetically that doesn't look great, especially if we're going to put a particular texture on there. We'd like that to continue all the way around the entire face. <coughs> So the best way to ensure that we've got a complete individual entity that runs through would be to convert our 3D sketch into what we call a fit spline. That will turn these two individual entities, the line and the spline, into one complete spline that runs all the way from end to end. So I'm going to select the entities. I'm going to go to my spline tools and fit spline. So if you're going to hit the tick, and you'll now see, if I hover over, you'll see that that's one complete spline. It now means that the path for the sweep is one individual spline, and it picks up the entire thing and creates one individual face. So that's a really nice, neat way of creating aesthetically pleasing faces that run the entire length of the sweep. If we go back to the model, you can see our headphone jack is inserted in place. Okay, the next thing we're going to look at is a new assembly of a part which we call a skid. Now a skid is a housing for extra components such as a pump and an engine, and it's basically a housing to protect those items themselves. Now this, uh, this skid here may live in perhaps a building site. It's got a few lugs on the top here to move it around with perhaps a crane. And down here, there's a few positions where we could move it around with a, a forklift. Now what I'm gonna do with this skid is I'm first off gonna insert manually some toolbox items into these individual holes here. 
So if you go to the, the toolbox itself, drill down until I find a, a suitable, suitable toolbox item. I'm simply going to drag and drop a toolbox item into the cylindrical hole. The item resizes automatically, hitting tab to flip its current direction. I can increase its length accordingly and simply hit the tick to insert that item. I then need to make these faces because it can still move in and out of that hole. And secondly, I'm going to put a washer and a nut on the rear. So back into the toolbox. Make that into position. And then secondly, I'm going to insert a nut. and also make that into a position. Now I'd like to propagate those individual toolbox items that I've just made it into a position against the next three holes that I can see. Now I don't want to have to complete that whole command again. So I'm simply going to select the toolbox items themselves, holding control, right click, and use a command here called copy with mates. That allows me to repeat a particular mating process in a similar set of selections. So first off, concentric. Now if you think about the second mate, which is in this selection here, it's actually going to be the same face. So I can repeat that mate. I can repeat the third mate and also the fourth, because the, th the third and the fourth mate are actually parallel planar with the opposing face. So it's fine to repeat those. Then all I need to do is accept that as my new mate position. That command stays open. We can now see that all I need to do is specify the new mate entity position. Third, second and fourth are retained. So I can very quickly by clicking once and then left clicking to accept insert all three items in their new positions. And if we have a look, those toolbox items are copied and also copied with their existing mates. Now, what we're getting now is a very large set of toolbox items. What I'm going to show you is a way of organizing these toolbox items. We can simply right click anywhere in the tree and create a new folder. To organize all these toolbox items, we can select them all simply by selecting the top one with control and click, holding shift and control and selecting the bottom and it will drag them all down. We could then simply drag and drop those into the box. Now what we're used to doing is creating perhaps an assembly and inserting toolbox items as and when. So we may find that there'll be no particular structure in regards to where those toolbox items exist in our tree. So selecting those might be quite tricky. What we can do is use the selection up here to select every toolbox items in our tree. They're all quickly selected, regardless of what hierarchy they're inserted into the assembly. I'm then going to drag and drop those into my toolbox items folder, like so. They now exist and will stay existing inside that toolbox items folder. Now what I'm gonna do next is I'm gonna populate these whole positions with toolbox items, but in a different way than I have done previously. So instead of dragging and dropping those into the assembly, I'm gonna use a great tool here called Smart Fasteners that will automatically populate a plate 
which may have holes in it with individual toolbox items. So my selection is this entire face, and I simply click Add. You'll notice that each individual whole wizard hole will then populate the toolbox item, like so. I'm going to increase very slightly the extent of that toolbox item. I'm then going to insert what we call a top stack and a bottom stack. So our top stack would be perhaps a washer. If you look in here, we've now got a washer in the hole. A bottom stack would be a nut. I'm just going to put a simple hex flange nut. Now it doesn't just do it in one here, it actually applies it to every single toolbox item which has been inserted on that particular face. Really great, very quick, useful tool. Now the next thing I do is I'm going to go back and insert some components into this assembly. Now I've got a, an existing engine here. Now this could be given to me by any manufacturer, but it might be quite a large assembly and quite power hungry to my machine. So what I'm going to do is create something called a speed pack. A speed pack is in fact a particular type of configuration. It allows me to minimize the information within the model simply by only selecting the faces which are important to me. I'm going to select the faces which I'm going to utilize and mate with. Those are the only faces that I need to position my assembly. Then simply hit the tick. So what I now get is a dumbed down version of that particular assembly. You'll see there is nothing in the tree. Now I'm going to save this onto my desktop.